Right, new video, new topic. Today we are gonna tackle how to make the um, prosthetic mold on flat, uh, how to cast the prosthetic, um, and how to apply it. I thought to in engage into this because I can't really just do sculpting. After a while, the information uh, become old. Um, so I thought, okay, I'll just show this as it's gonna be fairly simple. Plus recently I saw um, some people promoting their own courses and I know that you need a bit more information because not everyone knows how to do it properly. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm the best one at doing it, but I learn it from some of the best in the country. And it's not really complicated, really. You don't need a course. You don't need to spend money to learn how to do this. But I want to show you some little things that it will make your life a little bit easier. Um, so, yeah, let's get on with it. What you need to start is the pasta machine, your sculpt, a fine sculpting tool to cut the clay and Plastiline It's a French brand um, The sculptors that use it to sculpt prosthetics quite a few uh, I personally don't like it to use it for sculpting but the 40 sure it means that this is the hardness of the clay you see this is a cork clay, it's already soft. It's really good for what we're gonna do right now. I already pre-rolled some of the clay. You just roll it on the table. The first thing you do, find the right thickness. So this is from, let's have a look. Let's put it on three. And I'll show you the thickness. So we're gonna get this nice strip of clay. You see the thickness? Might be too thin for some, but I'm happy with this. This strip of clay is going to be our flashing. Okay, so it's gonna be the edge that we're gonna put around the prosthetic. The flashing is, is going to become what we're going to hold on for the prosthetic when we apply it. So we're going to cut a piece like that. And we're going to place it next to the sculpt. You need to follow the circumference of the prosthetic. And you push a little bit to make sure that it sticks. I use this clay and not monster clay because monster clay is non is non sticky clay. So this means that to do a trick like that, just pressing, it's not going to be enough to make it stick to the board. Then we're going to use the other side of the strip of clay that we cut with your finger help you twisting so it will follow better the sculpt start quite close to begin with when you put the clay because now we're going to do another step we'll try and do like a close up to see and show you exactly what I mean a mistake that many do, not necessarily a mistake, but this trick will show you, will help you make a nicer release of the prosthetic. You're gonna see now that the way I'm cutting is not straight. My sculpting tool has an angle, look. So now it's like this. I'm gonna put it this way and carry on cutting just the fine edge of this area. 
Why am I doing this? The reason is, once you do the mold, the silicon will go around it. And if you see into a section, if you don't cut with an angle, this is what I'm gonna see. If you leave it as it is, so you cut a square, what you're gonna have is your board, the flashing, and you might risk to have an undercut. So this is all a sharp edge. So this means that when the silicon goes around it, like this, this empty space is a rectangle. Where if you do it this way, this is your board, this is your flashing, and when the silicon goes around, there's no undercuts, there's no friction. It's literally easy to open it. You just bend the silicon on one side or like this part and will be upside down and lifting it but it will come out very easily so try to avoid this kind of flashing and do it this way and this is how it looked like here we have the aftermath of cutting the edges and you see that there's a shadow here and sometimes on the other side so what we need to do to avoid to create this, to leave this in the mold and have it like, uh, this is gonna pinch when you're gonna spray the cut plastic. We need to go all the way around doing this. A nice smooth sculpting tool. You do one side and then you do the other. It's always from outside in and you have it in the middle, smooth. Before that, I did it out of camera, forgot to record it. You take the same sculpting tools and keep in an angle. You go and clean what's the edge inside. The reason is because once you cut, you might have little parts that are lifted and you don't want the silicone to go inside. Otherwise, you have the same problem as this. What we want to do now is to create a flash in there. It's not going to cause any problem whatsoever. So the better, the smoother and the more angle it is, the better it is. The next step is making the wall where we're going to put the silicon. So there are several ways to do that. Uh, I'm doing something today that I started to do last week because I'm running out of clay, the water-based clay and I needed to make a wall for a mold. So I'm using monster clay. Ultimately all you need is just anything. You can use Play-Doh if the mold is not too big. You just need something that can contain the, the weight of the silicon, the pressure. So we're gonna make a wall around it. Don't go too far from the flashing. The reason is all this will be wasted silicon. So the closer you get, the less you need. Okay. So I'm going to do all this around and then I'll show you the next step. After we finish all that, what we're going to need is silicon to mold. This is what I'm using now. Plat Seal Gel 25. So you can use Plat Seal Gel, Pro Gel, any uh, silicon that is platinum silicon that is 25 sure or harder. The reason why we need something hard is because when we're going to scrape the silicon on the mold when it's something that has more resistance and not too soft because otherwise when you have the um, the scraper and you push a soft silicon you go and press too much and you underfill your prosthetic but anyway I'll show you how to do this step and then step by step I'll show you everything don't worry what you need now is this the leveler the reason is um, 
the silicon mold it needs to be completely flat now this is not the best level that you can buy this came out with one set of tools um, and I think I will have to get a new one but you need this to check there is level like this like this here and here to make that happen um, some fellows colleagues they used to divide the clay let's say we have one two three and four bowls and we put it underneath the wooden board in one corner I don't know if everyone does this I do this again this is not a law it's just the way how I do it we place the leveler there now from this angle it looks like it's going pretty well but we're gonna just press on this side gently until we get in the middle perfect middle let's have a look at this side Ooh. that's pretty much how is that, that still the same and I'll the other side it's fine perfect so next step pour in the silicon I'm not going to show you how to pour the silicon um, it's pointless but when you mix it make sure that you scrape the wall of the cap and then scrape the bottom the wall of the cap and the bottom in this way you have less pads are not mixed to each other if you don't mix it properly you're literally gonna have strands of clay that are not set and you wouldn't want that after mixing the silicon you should use a degasser now I don't have a degasser and this it could be a way to just learn how to do things on a budget I tried a couple of degassers they were terrible so if you have any suggestion uh, please leave a comment let me know what you use what brand but if you go it gently you don't have too many bubbles I mean we're gonna have a ton of them don't get me wrong but if you put the silicon low there's more likely that all these bubbles that are inside stay there so what we're gonna do we're gonna lift the cap up very tall and let it go down slowly now the thin string will not allow the big bubbles to exist they will pop because there's not enough space for them to survive so for this middle part that is where we have most of the details we're gonna go slow tall tall intending like, I mean, the cap is tall. We're going slowly filling up all the holes, all the gaps. We have our silicon set now, quite nice and hard. While the silicon is setting, I would advise to keep your cap with the leftover silicon and when you want to check, you check inside this pot because when this is set, this is set. In this case, when the silicon was gelled and hard enough, I put it outside because it's a really nice sunny day today, and that sped up everything. Now, we're gonna take this off. There you go, the wall is all gone. And now we're gonna peel the prosthetic off. Now this is a technique if you want to keep the prosthetic because when you're working on uh, a job and you do a prosthetic there's sometimes situation where you have to modify it so I will always advise ah you see it's been under the sun and the, the clay is all ruined but the concept still stand that basically you keep you hold your finger there and you just lift one side and you gradually hold it down in this way the sculpt doesn't lift 
and if you have to make a changes because you have time to do like a test or something you can modify the sculpt without re-sculpting from the beginning we're gonna get a cap put some alcohol inside this is the one that I have I get it from Amazon uh, it's not too bad price wise so we just give a nice clean all over I use alcohol in this case because it gives me more time to, on the mold because it doesn't evaporate as fast as the, as the acetone the next step is to clean up the mold so you can see that there's a little lip that goes up and when we're gonna put the prosthetic down it's not gonna help because it will lift slightly from here it basically lifts slightly up so what we're going to do is get a pair of scissors and we're going to cut all around with an angle you see so we went from this to this and this way this is smooth next step we need to release the mold so what we're going to do is you have different options this is one uh, there's another release but I think I finished it this is um, petroleum spray it's almost like a Vaseline and this is a wax this is enough for you uh, it's easier to find I think it's a little bit cheaper and it's pretty good for that so I'm going to show you now what to do so now we're going to release the mold. There are many, many more options to release it, but I'm gonna show you the one that is kind of more accessible and affordable. That's it, that's it really. Make sure that when you do this step, you do it with the door open. I have the door closed in my workshop right now because otherwise there's a light and noise and everything. Um, and then you let it dry for a bit. And then maybe you can do another layer. You can brush a little bit of Vaseline, stretch it out quite a lot when the mold is a bit more complicated. Like in this case, probably it was a good idea. So what I'm gonna do is just spray a layer of this right now just to help it come out easier. Let's prepare the cap plastic. I was thinking just to explain it and then do um, use the one that I already got made, but I'll just show you for the sake of the video. <coughs> this is the acetone that I use at the moment. Even this one bought on Amazon is when you're in a rush, that's the best option. If you have money to buy a canister of 25 liters, 50 liters, that is up to you. I go bit by bit. So, how are we gonna want this cap plastic? The cap plastic needs to be made one part of the cap plastic and four parts of the acetone. I already poured inside this. And we're gonna use a little measure just to have the right amount and we're pouring one cup of this and four of acetone I'm not gonna make a lot of it because I don't really need much one Two, three, and four. This will be enough to make the cap plastic thin that can go in the airbrush. Especially the airbrush that I use to spray cap plastic is not really an airbrush that you will use for it. You want something a little bit more powerful or strong, but. I have this, this is like a 30 pound cheap Amazon 
airbrush and that is fine for the job again you don't need to have expensive machinery or tools to do this kind of thing you can just go with cheaper option especially the beginning I mean I'm not at the beginning <laughs> I'm supposed to be more prepared but stuff is expensive and you're always on a budget especially nowadays so the cap plastic is ready this is all we need so let's start spraying the light went off is intentional when you spray the cap plastic what you want to have is the right light because when you have the right light it helps you to see the reflection of the cap plastic so you know where you're spraying it When you're spraying with the, with the airbrush, I want to give some advice. First of all, don't just use it like this because the cable, the tube will stay in the way. So you wrap it around your wrist and you take it like that. And this way, the, the tube will be here and not here. And when you go working on, it's better and it's not in the way. Then when you spray the cap plastic, the important thing is to spray from, uh, let's put it like this way. from here to here you get out of the mold because if you stop spraying here or here this area will be double the cap plastic and it's the closest to what we need for the um, for the edges so we don't want something that is too thick around the edges so we do like a printer we go left, right, left, right, left, right. Then we turn it and we do left, right, left, right. And then we turn again. Maybe you can put it diagonally and you do it like that. Three layers should be enough. I turn off the light to make sure that you can see. When we do the test, we never do it on the sculpt. No here. You can do it in here. You see what I'm pinching. You have quite a resistance as a first layer for the underneath then we go do all around there so that's why you have to make sure that when you stop with the cap plastic you do all the way out because this is your testing area let's prep our silicon we're going to use the same silicon that we use for the mold so we have our plat gel plat seal gel 25 gonna use not much the mold the mold is not big the process is not thick best way to actually um, know how much material you need is to scrape the sculpt when you scrape the sculpt and you have your your clay in a bowl you have an idea or roughly like the volume because uh, different clays have different weights and you can calculate it by the weight and what you need but ultimately for me I never really understood that so what I do is just squish and melt it inside the cup usually especially when uh, the sculpt is big and see how many cups I need so in that way I have an idea because usually like a pint has 250 around 300 grams of silicon Put it zero, don't forget that. And then we have to do another 42. That was around three scoops. Oh, there's a little bit too much. So we we'll take away a couple of grams. A couple of grams here and there are not gonna be too much of an issue. There you go, 42. Perfect. We mix our silicon, one here and one here. Now we're gonna use, we're gonna add the deadener. 
the Detna is a softener. There's different brands, different quality, different kind. There's all sorts of stuff. Like I can't spend uh, all day to explain all but a lot of things. I don't know either. There's like products that they have a name, a number, and like what does that mean? And some websites, some shops don't even explain what it is or why it's like that. So. <clears throat> what I'm gonna do is just mix, get some that that I have from a previous project, and how we calculate it for a prosthetic like that, we can do around 80 90 percent of deadna. That this means that you will have A and B that is 42 and 42, let's say 40, and is the total is 80. So inside here, if we do 100 percent, we pour 80 grams of deadna. 78 80 So this is the dead that we need it's quite thick in color You can see there But the reason why it's like that is because when it gets diluted with the uh, rest of the silicon It will be more translucent. I mean you think obvious mate but I'm trying to explain everything. There's a technique to understand if you put too much or not enough pigment, and it's to put like a black dot on a stick, you dip it, one, two, three, four, five, six. You see, this the color of the marker pen underneath wasn't that visible until six seconds. And that tells you that the pigment is enough. This it might be too much because this was the bottom of a bucket that it has all the pigmentation. So there might be some problem. But at the same time, I don't want to I'm not trying to make the perfect prosthetic straight away because if we have any issues, we can discuss how to fix those issues. But there's enough pigment to work on that prosthetic. And let's see how it goes. We're gonna do the same trick we've done before to check if the board is leveled. And why do we need to do this? So the prosthetic will be pouring a silicon that is quite soft, quite runny. So what we need is something that is perfectly leveled so we don't have the silicon going either one way or another. In this way, the cylinder will stay in the middle. So once we scraped, it stay where it was supposed to. So at this point, we have our silicon ready. What we're gonna do is mix it. We're gonna mix A and B first. Scrape nicely the bottom. Try to use all of it. Not to miss any grams. There you go. And then the detna. This is another silicon that it should be placed in a degasser. The that, that I'm using is a low viscosity. So it allows all the big bubbles to burst on the surface. And then same concept, we're gonna pour it high and slow. What I'm starting to do now is create an abundance of silicon on one side. This is probably too much silicon anyway. What we want to do is put it on just one side, and then when you go with the scraper, and by the way, I'm using this scrapers a bit pricey, but the nice thing is the edge here is already rounded up. And it's done by a machine, not by you. So it's really good and it doesn't catch or scrape or ruin the mold. You press it down there and you pull. 
there you go if you look on the edge where the silicon is there's no shiny bits this it means that there's no silicon there but we still have to clean it because we can't leave it like that there's still a percentage of silicon that if it sets the cap plastic is not going to melt properly and the edges are going to be bad what you want to do at this stage is to get a cotton pad and gently turn it and rub away an area in the middle here that will help you have the cap the edges free of any kind of silicon. You do it everywhere. Try to find an angle where you have a light that has a reflection on the mold so it will show you the difference between an area that you clean and an area that you didn't an area that does need support in terms of removing the silicon if a mold like for example here it feels like it's under field okay so what you want to do is to get some more silicon with a stick and just pour it on these areas not too much otherwise it will go up to the edges you can always when it's set before spraying the cap plastic using like a silicon with a thickener and build up on the back as long as it's just in the middle and if it's just like a gory bit a gory prosthetic we're gonna keep our cap for the checking the pot life shout out that brush and when this is almost set then it's a bit tacky we're gonna go with the cap plastic to spray the back so the silicon is finally set what we're gonna do now is just wait move the camera there you go is to spray the other side We're going to do the same thing of turning the board, do it from this angle and then the other side. When you spray the cap plastic, you don't want to be too close, you don't want to be too far. Let's say like an inch and a half, two inches away. Uh, three fingers? There we go. So now we're gonna wait that uh, the cap plastic will dry. Probably there's no rush now. And then I'll show you how to demold it. While the silicon is setting, I wanna show you a little bit of cleaning the airbrush. Every time you finish to use the airbrush with the cap plastic, you remove the cap plastic and you fill it with acetone. And you let acetone go through a, the strongest setting and you go on your airbrush and then you close it and make some bubbles so what you do is this in this way the acetone keep going in and out in and out in and out and you have like like a pre-cleaning because if you use it and then let it dry it will create like a film that is the same film it will be on the silicon that it will in make incapacitate the cap the um, airbrush to work straight away after sometimes what I do is just pressing it back because what you do you just move the needles back with no pressure so the arsenal will stay there and then I let it like this, and I let it rest on its place. Now that the cap plastic and the silicon is dry, well, the cap plastic is dry and the silicon is set, we're gonna brush some talc on top of the prosthetic. The reason why we put talc is because we don't want, when we release, 
we remove the prosthetic from the mold, the cut plastic touch itself and it stick to each other, to itself. So we already start right there. Then I'm going to start from this side. I'm going to lift. See, I lift a little bit of cut plastic. And with the brush, I go underneath. The brush always needs to be filled with talc. Don't be stingy with talc, because you might have to redo the prosthetic. You go gentle. You see what I do? Is the brush to remove the prosthetic. Especially at the beginning. You can go a little bit harsh. If you're in a rush, you know what you're doing. You know? But the important thing is you always put. And this is the part that we need to be careful about. Because this is where we have all the undercuts, all the details of the sculpt. So we're going to take our time. Don't rush it. See, what you want to avoid is this, because it will, is this, because then it will keep pulling the prosthetic in a natural way. What you do is move the talc on that side. Don't pull it all the way, always from one spot, because this area will have more traction than pulling than everything else. So you can do it like that. But originally, when I sculpted, I wasn't even planning to make a mold of it. Otherwise, probably I would have spent a little bit more time cleaning up some areas. There you go. My prosthetic is out. Don't do that. So this is the prosthetic. It's finished. Now the next step will be to apply it and see how it comes out. Now if you look, I don't know why. I think because the intricacy of the sculpt, I should have let it go a little bit slower maybe put a retard there because there's some a lot of areas where there's air bubbles and this is what happened when you don't have a degasser now this is a gory bit and it's very intricate so it's natural that it comes out all these bubbles um, and it's not even that much of an issue because it's going to be like a gory application but when you have like a different prosthetic is like a, a cheek or the back of a hand you don't have this much of an issue I never had this many bubbles because um, it's a flat and smoother area and as I said if I was if I knew I was gonna mold it I would spend a little bit more time to refine and round it up some areas and make it not as ash for the for the mold and app uh, application because what you need to understand is that everything you do it doesn't is not gonna be working all the time 100% just because you're making it and it's just proper of the mold there are some shapes forms and and things that you do in the sculpt application that we're creating something that is not real and it requires more attention more time more thinking more planning but the steps are this one It's up to you to then use them and utilize them in the proper way but yeah this is the prosthetic and we are finally we are finally at the application point um, so from the time that I've done 
that recorded the first part to this is passed over a week. Um, I started to do an application when then there was issues in the filming, so I had to remake the piece. This piece came out better. Um, all I've done is uh, it was basically um, uh, pouring the silicon from her pie in the middle, so the silicon had all the bubbles break because there was quite a lot, and this one came out really, really good. All right, so application. Important thing, you always start from the middle, okay? Uh, there's different techniques. Um, sometimes in this case, I'm not, I'm not too fussy about uh, making a, an incredibly perfect and methodical job because ultimately it's quite like a, of a gory bit. Um, and I always feel self-conscious when I ask friends to do favors to me. Uh, in this case, I had this friend there who was my model to apply this piece, and I felt like, oh, I need to do it quick, I need to do it quick. So <laughs> that's why um, it might feel a little bit rushed, but ultimately it worked really well. The edges came out really nice. So you start with um, um, putting some glue on the prosthetic. Uh, a way that you can do it to decide and have the right size and shapes if you put just glue on the back of the prosthetic and then when it's still wet you put on on the place where you want the prosthetic to be and when you take it off part of it get transferred on the other side so you kind of mark or the the spot you you basically put the glue on and then you can put some more to have like a proper um, adhe adhesive effect uh, I like to use um, Prosade as a contact glue so you put like glue on one side and another instead of just one side because you need uh, a very nice grip from both sides and then mitt in the middle and this way you have like a good effect and it's quite strong Prosade is really strong as a glue and it's the cheapest one that you can buy uh, the other ones is a silicon base they're really they're really good especially because when you're in a rush because the the glue um, dries really quickly on its own where prosade because it's a water-based glue uh, needs to the water needs to evaporate so when you use the prosade it's important that you remember that the glue needs to be clear not white spots now the old prosthetic is applied we're going to bring out our acetone and with the cotton bud we're going to start to dissolve all the edges so I use the cotton bud instead of brushes or sponges or I don't know whatever you want to use because when you do uh, use the cotton bud you you turn it a little bit almost like not almost like when, when we were cleaning the edges of the cut plastic uh, from the silicon when we run the silicon in the mold it's basically kind of like a similar thing or in this way because the edges are quite thin I'm rubbing it but when I'm rubbing it I'm I'm trying to do it towards the outside so the edges get dissolved nicely there's a, there's a nice fading of the cut plastic on the on the skin After that I remove all the flashing, I go around again to have a look and where they are still a little bit visible. Then as you, you can notice that in the application there are some parts where the, the cut plastic kind of folded on itself, have like sharp bits that came out. Uh, that is, if it's just cut plastic and you go with the cotton bud, uh, like with quite a bit of acid, not too much of the drips, but nice wet from it. You can just go on top of it, it dissolves it, so it's smoothing it down nicely. So we're starting with the first color. I always start, I always start with the red, starting to try and match it with the skin underneath. Um, it's not always easy, especially in this case, because I didn't do any color matching. I just went for the color that I had and I thought okay I'll just show how to make it work 
for this kind of application. So we went to do two colors that were completely different. On in real life, the skin was a lot more red than what it looks like in the screen. After the red, I like to use a bit of green. It is <clears throat> It's difficult to explain like painting theory uh, or how to paint because um, there's a lot of eye to use. It, there's a lot of understanding what color I'm missing based on what I have. So you look in a skin and it can be like, okay, there's a little bit of green missing from what I'm doing, or there's a little bit of red. You can notice the difference between something that is a bit too blue or not blue enough. And it's, it's very much like paying attention to what you have in front of you, having a nice light. It does help a lot to look, because for example, uh, there are some edges that you will see in terms of painting that are a lot more no noticeable on the screen than they were for me when I was there. So when you apply, if you apply in front of a mirror and then you look at the mirror quite often, because looking in the mirror is like a different perspective from what you're doing and it helps. Um, it's almost like when you are painting or sculpting something, you step back from it because you need a need different perspective. So if you have a big mirror and you want to do an application or do it in front of a mirror because it will help understanding what you're doing even more. I like to go when I paint very slow. I like to go like a layer after layer, taking my time to understand what color I'm missing, what needs to be done. So I keep jumping from uh, a little bit of red. I've done a bit of green. I've done. I'm doing a spattering of brown, trying to uh, get it to the color a little bit faster. Because again, as I said before, I was feeling bad that it was taking me too long for the application. So now we're going for a brown creating a little bit of their modeling that is on the back of the, the model. Um, it's a long process. Um, there's a long way to get to the final step. Like here, I've tried to do, um, I tried to do it quickly because I wanted to get a result very fast and be able to leave in the video like not a, a sped up video but I'll show you how I do the spattering how I move my hands and fingers but you need to take your time you need to do um, you need to take your steps and process and do it how you need to do it Especially at the beginning, especially if you're practicing, if you're not on set for a job or uh, you have a deadline, because sometimes when you are on set, you have to do a lot of work to apply in a very small amount of time. Uh, the last thing that I've done, I had to uh, basically sculpt with the silicon gel on the skin, a prosthetic in like 25 minutes, and it didn't come out great, but this is because that sometimes production don't understand that this process, every step of it, requires time. And we can't rush it through any of them because then the result is not going to be as it should, as it could. Uh, but there are ways to do it faster, like when I have to do jobs for myself, not when I work for others, but when, when I am the head of the project in terms of like prosthetics, uh, I have to apply a piece. I usually put glue all over the back, uh, not until the edges, so that one I can do it separately nicely. I put glue on the back of model or the face or whatever and just slap it on as fast as possible because I know that in five minutes someone's gonna come and tell me that oh sorry you're not having 30 minutes anymore you have 15 
So you always have to take in consideration the possibility that your times get cut off. This doesn't necessarily happen on big projects because they're discussed and so you have the time that is been given by the production, by the, the prosthetic department that you're working for. But on little projects, especially when you work for like fashion, the prosthetics are getting to fashion more and more, but it's, it's quite a fresh thing. So when you deal with the kind of clients, they don't really know what they're asking for, they don't know what they're going to do. They, there's been a couple of times that for the client was a surprise. It's like, oh, so you're doing all this? I say, yeah, I send you pictures to approve. And uh, we discussed that. <laughs> it's like, what, what are we talking about? But yeah, it happened. So don't ever uh, uh, get surprised. So we've done a bit of the old base of the skin. You can still see a little bit on the right. And for example, talking about having a mirror, when I was there, that line on the right, it wasn't really that visible. It was more like on the left side. But anyway, when we've done that, we're gonna to start to paint the inside of the skin. I'm going for a dry infection. I'm not trying to do a fresh, I'm not gonna to try to do like a, a red gory. I want to go for something a little bit more, I would say subtle, it's not really that subtle considering the sculpt. But I wanna go for something that's a bit more disgusting, that is old, almost dusty. So we're going for brown initially and then I realized I want to do a little bit darker because I really want to make like the skin that it was completely rotten like there was nothing left in it so I start to add like a, a heavy wash of dark colors in the smallest of the hole so from one side to another the, the, the smallest I go the darker I start to paint uh, with the airbrush right now, I did a little bit of purple. Sometimes this is a good thing to do in the first step because then everything that goes on top of it, even if you go heavy, you can cover it and have uh, like a translucency in a certain way. But I decided in this case to do it afterwards. So basically what I'm doing with the airbrush is that I'm going on top of all the areas that are indented everything that it goes under the level of, I don't know, the edges and create some more shadows in, on the, it bring back the sculpt because this is something that you risk to do if you paint in flat, if you're not, um, like painting a prosthetic is not just putting paint on it because then the sculpt risks to lose all the details. So what you want to do is try to make, a, not try, you have to make a paint, a paint job that it brings back the sculpt so you repaint the shadows the indentation they overlaps and you emphasize them so even from far away when you are when the prosthetic is on camera you can tell what it is and it's not just a flat piece because you spend time with the sculpt so you want to bring back everything that you've done and this is a way to do it then after i've done some of the shadows I start to make a bit of veinings. Um, don't ever use the airbrush and make veins following the edges of the prosthetic. You're literally making a circle around it and all you have missing is an arrow pointing at it saying these are the edges. So when you paint always go on the opposite direction of the edges, break it up and create some areas. Then it might even follow the edge in some areas where maybe it is heavy, but then at that point, in that specific point where you decide to do that part because it's necessary for uh, hiding the edges, because sometimes you have problems happen, it's like that is normal. Uh, create like for example an excessive of veins to justify that like you basically have to mask it and hide it behind other intentional sometimes you have to uh, do an application a paint job that it wasn't planned it might even turn out that it's pretty good but it just because you needed to 
cover a mistake and this I heard this kind of story quite often so, oh that was amazing uh, well how do you do this well honestly I had to do this because there was this problem with that problem and I had to hide it for the veinings for painting veins I always advise to my students or to my whoever asks me um, or I'm teaching anyway to look at a picture of rivers from uh, satellite pictures or look at leaves for plants don't look on only the um, anatomy books pictures because that kind of pictures are limited and repeat themselves because we have the veins are mostly at the same position for everyone but if you want to do something that is horror that is more uh, fantastical you do need some sort of like imagination so if you don't know how to do it or you feel like they always come out wrong look at nature nature is the best reference that you can have for absolutely everything horror movies, sci-fi movies, I'm discovering watching YouTube, uh, uh, natural videos, history videos, that they, there's a lot of stuff that is in nature that basically inspired everything, everything we see in a movie, so don't go and copy other things, just go for inspiration from nature. So at this point, I'm gonna do, I'm doing a bit of like a brown wash, like again trying to give that kind of old horrible disgusting look uh, almost if it was like grease of oil you know um, so that's why I went for brown you will see later I'll go for other things so that I think it was a bit too much looking at now because the dangerous thing is when you put these colors diluted like that inside this alcohol so the painting you've done underneath is base is alcohol based paint so there all the alcohol reactivated and if you see now that I wiped it I, I left those two lines and they're not looking right even though when you have blood and it starts to coagulate and you wipe it off you always have that ring or the edges because that is the first part that dries out by the heat of your skin but anyway covered it um, and now I found this pipette on uh, on Amazon and I made like quite a, a, a lot of paint and color that I start to put on top of it it's kind of like a, a fresh color a fresh blood but still kind of dry and then it's finished uh, just a little bit of touches here and there I use the back of the hand instead of the fingers because I don't want to leave the fingerprints but more, more like a smudge and and then I'm happy with the result I want to thank you everyone for watching this video I really hope you enjoy that I really hope it's going to teach you everything that you need and Please like and subscribe, leave the comments, ask me for what you would like to see and learn. And if I know how to do it, I'll make a video about it. So, thank you very much for everything, for watching, commenting, following and supporting. And I'll see you in the next one.